When I interviewed for the URSA board position, Allison flatly shared with me the, the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal for URSA. And it really spoke to me, and I'll, I'll share it with you too. So the BHAG for URSA is to be a primary resource to curb the worldwide physical inactivity epidemic. And when I heard that, that is something that motivates me every day. I'm passionate about it, and that's what I'm focused on continuing to make sure that as the, the chair of URSA that we can continue to reach towards this goal. You're listening to episode 131 of the Fitness Business Podcast. We'd like to thank this month's premier podcast partner, Tribe Team Training, the global leaders in providing team training solutions to health and fitness clubs and studios around the world. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Chantal, and our special guest this week is the chairman of URSA and executive vice president of fitness for New Evolution Ventures, Derek Gallup. We start this week's show chatting about the agenda for URSA, what we can expect from Derek as the chairman, and what goals he has for the association over the next 12 months. Later in the show, I asked Derek to share a little bit about his career in the fitness industry, and as you're going to hear, he has an immense amount of experience. So in addition to chatting about URSA, he also shares some great business advice for club owners. We talk about leading and growing the PT department in a club, and he shares tips on growing the retail income line on our P&L. Also coming up later in the show, I chat to Lauren Greshner from Millennial 2020, an event where world-leading consumer brands and retailers come together with the most innovative and disruptive startups to shape and realize the future of commerce. Lauren is joining me to tell us all about their upcoming event in Sydney, Australia. We're about to transition to this week's main interview with Derek Gallup, but first, here's a message from one of our podcast partners. Tribe Team Training has a world-class training system that will ensure your coaches thrive in your club and help you keep your best coaches. Find out about getting your trainers Tribe certified. Go to tribeteamtraining.com or click on the link in today's show notes. Derek, welcome along and thank you for joining us on the Fitness Business Podcast. I am so excited to be here today. I'm looking forward to talking with you. First and foremost, I have to say a huge congratulations on your selection of chairman of URSA from July of this year. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, you know I'm humbled by the opportunity, and it really kind of opens my eyes to how large the industry is, but also how small the industry is when it comes to people, but also the huge opportunity that lays ahead of us. Give us a bit of an overview. What do you see on the agenda for URSA? Well, you know, Chantel, the, the, the thing that inspired me to want to be part of it, you know, when I interviewed for I wasn't 100% positive this was the right thing that for me to do. You know, I, I, as you mentioned, I've got a busy schedule, um, and, and I wasn't sure if I, I wanted to find something. I'm always challenging myself to do something outside of NEV that can help the industry. And when I interviewed for the URSA board position, Allison flatly shared with me the, the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal for URSA. And it really spoke to me, and I'll, I'll share it with you too. So the BHAG for URSA is to be a primary resource to curb the worldwide physical inactivity epidemic. And when I heard that, that is something that motivates me every day. I'm passionate about it, and that's what I'm focused on, continuing to make sure that as the, the chair of URSA that we can continue to reach towards this goal. Derek, tell me this, how does your role as the chairman specifically impact that agenda for the organization over the next 12 months? Well, I think you know what we've got to look at is what are the strategies that we're going to do to help reach that sort of uh, aspirational goal of, of curbing physical inactivity. And I think one of the biggest areas of opportunity I see is when you look at the penetration rates of the general population and what percent have a gym membership, it's to me, it screams of opportunity. You know, you've got some of the most mature markets, say U.S. and, and uh, parts of Europe, where are the highest penetration, and we're not even at 20%. We're only at 18.5% in the U.S. So not even one in five people in the U.S. have a gym membership. So that's the other thing that really motivates me because I know how beneficial it is to be part of a gym, to be part of that, of that community but also the exercise and health benefits you get from that. So I'm driven every day to say, how can we get to where 
ultimately, I would love it to where the majority of people, at least in the US and eventually worldwide, but start there. How do we get to where more people have a gym membership than less? And once you sort of hit that tipping point, it really is exciting. So tell us, what can the US fitness industry and the global fitness industry expect from Derek as the URSA chairman? There's, there's, there's kind of, I'll, I'll call it the three, maybe even four main things I'll talk about. One is, you know, I think our role is to make sure that it's, it's important that we continue to have long, young, energetic, enthusiastic, passionate people becoming part of URSA and being URSA members. And so one of the goals is how do we attract more millennials uh, to be part of the board and to be, to be URSA members themselves? And I also think that that goes hand in hand with technology and how do we embrace it and how do we make sure that the fitness industry is utilizing technology to really have a synergistic uh, effect on growing the industry. And, and I don't know that I've got the answer. I think we're still working it through. We created a technology and innovation council last year that we're going to continue. So that, that, that I'll call is kind of one is attracting millennials and, and technology. The other one that I'm really passionate about, you know, is I, I've, one of the things, one of the things that was holding me back maybe from not being part of the URSA board is, you know, I've been to 20 URSA conventions before I had been part of the board. But I hadn't really always recognized who were the board members. I mean, there were name tags and so forth. But one of the things that I really want to get after is having a high visibility presence for the board members during the convention. But not only and, and I want us to be dressed appropriately so we can be interacting with the vendors and giving them our personal feedback on some of the things that we're doing. So the goal is going to be you're going to see a high visibility leadership presence from the URSA board in San Diego in March. And then the, the last thing, and you kind of talked about U.S. And so it, it, this, one's, this one's specific to U.S., but I also think that when things can happen in the U.S., they can also open the gateway for them to happen internationally as well. So there's a big push on the FIT Act that really has been around and, and floating for almost 10 years now. But we have some great connections through some of our board members right now on Capitol Hill. And I think that the... the we have the best timing ever to get this act to pass. And what the FIT Act does in the US, we've got medical spending accounts that people can save their money into this account pre-tax. So it's, it's money that doesn't get taxed and you can use it on medical expenses. Well, we're really excited about the opportunity to take some of this money and be able to spend up to $2,000 a year for families on gym membership, on personal training and on youth sports. And I think that this is one of the, of all the years I've been in the industry, this is one of the legislative pieces that if we can get this passed, would have one of the biggest impacts ever on our industry. And I do, as you start to talk about how could we go from 18.5% to eventually 50% penetration of people with memberships in the US, the FIT Act is one of those core enablers. In case there is anyone that's listening that isn't familiar with the FIT, FIT Act or hasn't necessarily been involved and wants to have a better understanding, I'll put a link in today's show notes on some literature that they can read up and have a look because, as I said, I know that there was a huge coverage of it at URSA this year and no doubt it will be the same coming up in 2018. So I wanted to also, because we have spoken a lot about URSA, so let's talk a little bit more about you and your experience in the industry because you've been in the fitness industry for 23 years and many of our listeners may not realize your role in club leadership. And I was doing a bit of stalking on your LinkedIn profile and there are some seriously impressive brands and logos on there. So tell us a little bit more about um, your career in the industry so far and also tell us about New Evolution Ventures. Sure. Well, well I want to kind of do this maybe chronologically and I'll kind of go back to before I was even in the industry. You know, uh, I actually, my, my degree is, is marketing and kinesiology from Oregon State. So I, I was very passionate about fitness, but also how do you kind of, uh, uh, how do you get more people excited about being part of that? But I ended up going around and being in department store retail and wound up uh, being able to move back home to Hawaii with my wife. And my wife ended up becoming the manager of the Gold's Gym Waikiki. And when we would come home and share stories about our days, I found myself really longing for and almost envious of the things that she was doing. She was, you know, motivating people to get off their couch and run in the Honolulu Marathon or taking people that had had, you know, serious injuries and getting them to be back to 100%. And, I, and this is this 
highly, highly motivated me. So I went and met with the owners of the gym at the time, it was Ode Hogan. And Ode and I hit it off great. And I thought maybe it would be a consulting job or something, but it turned out that he wanted me to be part of the team. So in Hawaii, I helped them grow from one to three clubs where I was running their, uh, I came in because my background was more apparel. So I ran the retail, I introduced nutrition uh, in those clubs, and I helped them convert their independent contractor PT business to, to, to an in-house. Then a couple of years after doing that, 24-Hour Fitness bought our clubs. I think they were surprised that we were doing the type of revenue we were in those categories out of just three locations. So they moved me out to the corporate office to help them get going at different times in, in each of those categories, the, the retail business, nutrition business, and personal training. The last eight years at 24 Hour Fitness, I ran the personal training and group fitness uh, parts of their of their business. Um, so I, I had 15 years at 24 Hour, and then um, you know, we sold the, the company sold in 2006, and in 2008, Mark Mastroff, who was the founder of 24 Hour Fitness, and Jim Rowley, who had been my boss for a while and a divisional president there, uh, and Mike Feeney. Uh, started up New Evolution Ventures and invited me to come be part of that. And that was in 2009. So the, the, the conversation was, hey, you know, we're, we're, we don't have any brands that we're really doing yet, but here's what we're thinking about. This is my a breakfast with Mark and Jim. Uh, we're looking at uh, an acquisition with Crunch. And I'd heard, you know, I, I, the Crunch was very uh, well, had very strong PR. So I'd heard of Crunch. Uh, we were looking at, uh, we had three clubs in Canada that we were looking to have partner with Steve Nash. Um, we were talking with Madonna on a brand called Harn Candy, and we were talking with the Ultimate Fighting Championship for a brand called UFC Gym. And I took a leap of faith because I knew that these guys were years ahead of other people that I've ever worked with and just really great people, great family men, and just great people to work with. So I took a leap of faith, and, and that was in 09. And now here we are with Crunch being at 60 corporate clubs and 250 franchise. UFC Gym went from zero clubs to now we have 19 corporate stores and 120 franchise locations. Nash, we end up selling that, but I still do some consulting with them. And they're at 22 locations, the largest operator in Vancouver. And they're actually now a franchisee of UFC Gym. And Hard Candy is uh, now eight locations uh, all international. And we've actually added in some other brands. We've added, we partnered with Alex Rodriguez and we have A-Rod Energy Fitness in Mexico. And we've got some fantastic operators in uh, Selena Short and uh, Lush Afiaki that are in uh, Australia, in Sydney and Melbourne, uh, operating Crunch, Hard Candy and UFC Gym. So the business has just grown tremendously and it's been really exciting. And so my role is that I kind of leaned on all the things I've done in my past. So I've, I, I head up the retail and I also head up all the personal training for all the different brands we do worldwide. That is just such a huge role, Derek. I mean, to be doing that on, you know, in addition also now as the chairman of URSA, I mean, it gives me such a good perspective into your background. So thank you for taking us through that kind of timeline so that we can share some of your knowledge and expertise with the listeners of the show. Give us any tips that you've had in your experience when it comes to leading or growing the personal training department within clubs. You know, so it's it's interesting, right? As we got kind of, you know, into our third brand and I was sort of, I, I don't know if I was as strategic as I've even gotten now, right? And I was challenged by our CEO to say, hey, what, what walk me through the strategy when you go into a new brand and how do you, how do you get this going? And, and you know, Chantal, I'm, I'm big on acronyms, but I can never, I have to do acronyms that are memorable. So I really kind of have an acronym for how to lead and grow your PT and it's the six P's. Right. And it starts with the first P is people, which is the most important part, you know, selecting the right people, developing them. Yeah, and then when it comes to trainers, like what is your what is, how, how are you going about finding them? How are you recruiting them? How are you uh, onboarding them? And then how are you developing them at 90 days and beyond? Right. So it's people is first. The next is products. What is it that you're actually selling? You know, we do. 60 minute, 30 minute sessions, group training, nutrition. Those are all the things that are the products that we're going to be putting out there. Then the next one, they kind of go together. It's pricing and pay. So what are the price that you're gonna establish for your product, but also what is the pay? Now the issue is you have to have established some margins that you wanna get. So those two sort of need to go hand in hand. 
And I've been big on the way that we do pricing is sort of leveled so that a more experienced trainer has a higher price, but also can have a higher pay and have a great career working within the same organization throughout their tenure of being a trainer. Next is presentation. So that's a couple of things. One is what's the presentation of our clubs? What's the presentation of our workout floor and our functional training space? What's the presentation of our trainers? How do, how professional do they look and what is sort of the uniform we expect? And how do we actually present personal training to get people excited and want to make this purchase to help them reach their goals? And then the last piece that kind of ties everything together is process. And process, you know, when I go back to 24 Hour Fitness, that was really, in addition to people, the process was the thing that really was the differentiator. It was a, what allowed us to do something over 400 locations when I was there and, and really kind of replicate from one club to another, have some scalability to what you do. So the process and sticking to certain key elements of the process is really critical to success in personal training. Derek, with some of those brands that you just listed previously, what springs to mind for me with a lot of those, and I must admit also visiting the US and going to some of the boutique studios as well, is just how strong the retail offering is in some of those places. And you mentioned that 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 is a big part of your background is the retail. Can you just give us a little bit of insights or perhaps some tips when it comes to growing the retail income line on our P&L? Yes. So, you know, the, the, the biggest part of the retail business for our brands, and again, I think we kind of lead with a fitness first mindset, right? Fitness is the key differentiator that we look at. We want to be the innovators in, in fitness. I like to talk about being at the tip of the spear for all things fitness, right? So when it comes to that, we really, our first focus is on products with which our trainers can help our members get results, because it's all about results as far as how long people are going to stay, how many people they're going to refer, we, what can we do to get the results? So the number one area of retail business for us stems from nutrition. DotFit is our partner that not only it's about products, but it's really about the program. The program is about, I know your height, weight, gender, age, which then means I know what you're burning for calories and I know what the calorie intake should be. And we're going to give you the right nutrition at the right time through DotFit Nutrition. So nutrition is far and away our number one retail category. The second category, and again, kind of coming back to the trainers being the key focus here is workout accessories. Some of the key things we'll look at there are foam rolling for self myofascial release, whether it's from you know, our partner Trigger Point, or we've also introduced Hyperize, which actually has some vibration elements uh, going on with their with I their I just rolling. saw that. I saw Amanda Vogel doing a uh, product test on that last week. Have you tried it yet I yourself? Haven't. I was asked. I said to Amanda, "Does does the fact that that it's got the uh, the vibration does it make it any less painful than normal foam rolling?" <laughs> well, you know, I, I'll, it's interesting you say that because I do think that typical foam rolling without vibration does have some pain associated with it. Where if if you've got vibration, you don't have to go quite as hard on the roll to get some benefit. So I actually have found one of the big key things is you can get the vibration helping you in the beginning when it really, really is painful to, to foam roll. And then as you start to get better on the other, the other science behind it is that with the vibration, it's actually bringing more blood flow in there and taking out some of the elements that we're trying to get out of our muscles so that we're ready for a pre-workout. That makes a lot of sense. You've, uh, you've sold it into me. I'll, I'll give it a try. It, I, I'm, I'm a fan. I just actually did my vibrating foam roll this morning. My only thing is I have to make sure I got the garage door closed because I don't want to wake everybody up in my house. <laughs> Fair enough. So we've got nutrition and then yeah. accessories. And accessories and even some home workout things. For example, like TRX, if we teach the, the members uh, suspension and, and even a little bit of the rip trainer in, in the gym, when they're when say they're they have days they don't make it to the gym or maybe they're traveling, this is something really easy to pack in your bag and take with you. And now we've we've enabled you to still have success and stay in your uh, I'll call it kind of your success routine even when you're traveling. So it comes back to those things. Then the next piece for us is kind of that apparel and the branding elements. And I think that's maybe some of the things that you were looking at in the boutiques because I think boutiques are fantastic at doing these things. You know what, Derek? There's a large portion of my uh, pay goes towards um, goes towards the apparel in retail in in gym facilities. Well, I, I, you know what, and, and the good news is that there's a lot of 
members that are also doing that and, and they're proud to wear the brand. If we can get them results and they're loving being there, they want to wear UFC gym or crunch uh, or hard candy, uh, whatever the brand is that they're, that they're in there and they want to represent that has been fantastic for us. And you know, the, there's a, there's an, an interesting last piece of the retail business that, that sometimes isn't really discussed, but I, I think it's important. And I'm, I call it the, I forgot business. You know, you, people show up at the gym and there's many things that maybe that they haven't brought with that are important to the business. And again, I talked about my being an acronym guy. I actually have an acronym for the key four products that are in the I Forgot business. That's what it is. It's legs and it's it's locks, earbuds, gloves, and socks. And that actually makes up a decent chunk of our business. Oh, you're kidding. That's Isn't oh. it interesting? I wouldn't have thought that it would be significant enough of a percentage, you know, especially compared to those other three categories that that you just mentioned, it, it's it's the fourth one. But but again, it, it's it, it, there's a there's a large portion of the I forgot. Percent. And think about yourself. If there's been times that there was something you wanted to you wanted to work out, and you open your bag and say, like, oh, I forgot whatever. You know, the other thing is there's maybe a second S, which is really men's shorts. That seems to be another big one that is in the I how, forgot. How on earth are men forgetting their shorts? <laughs> You know what? We're men. I don't know. I don't have a great answer. Socks I can understand, but if you're rocking up without your shorts, I'm a little bit worried. <laughs> great opportunity to sell a bit of apparel, though. So, Derek, listen, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. There's one last question that we like to finish off, and we call this our fit bizpiration. And I'm hoping that you can leave us with a couple of quick tips on your top three business tips, say, for our FBP family, regardless of their size of their business. We'd like to thank our sponsor, OneFitStop, for their support, and we highly recommend all fitness professionals go to onefitstop.com to find out how their software will enable you to take control of day-to-day management in your fitness business. OneFitStop's scheduling, client management, programming, and payment collection tools will set your business up for success. So, you know, I I talked about results. So this, this first one is, Focus on the results of your members and you will get results in your business. Great tip. And number two? Number two is your business is all about your people. Mm-hmm. And then my last one, I didn't talk much about kind of, I, I, I'm big on kind of facing our fears. Like everybody's got fears and, and, and even in business, there's professional fears. I didn't really go through those, but the last thing I'll do is turn your fear list into your to-do list. Derek, thank you so much for joining us today. I have been looking forward to chatting to you. Congratulations once again on your appointment with Ursa. Very, very excited to see uh, what happens over the next 12 months. So thank you so much for joining us on the Fitness Business Podcast. Well, thank you. I I really enjoyed our our time to get a chance to talk together. It was great. Oh, there's one more thing that I just realized, and that is in my inbox yesterday, I had a note saying that uh, the agenda is out for URSA 2018. How exciting is that? It's fantastic. I just... I, I don't know how the URSA team is even able to, to get like six months out in front of this. They're, they're amazing in the work that they're able to do. Just phenomenal. So, guys, make sure that you jump onto the URSA website. Check it out because already the keynote speakers have been announced. The overarching agenda has been announced. So you can check it out now. And I think that uh, registrations are already open, if I'm correct. I, I believe so, yes. Very, very exciting. Well, Derek, thank you once again for joining us. All right. Thank you. Get ready for this week's bonus segment, your extra injection of information, education, and inspiration to strengthen your fitness business. I'm joined today by Lauren Greshner, the event head of Millennial 2020 in Sydney. Lauren, welcome along to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. So tell us a little bit about the event. So Millennial 2020 is uh, it's a global event, and it's run previously in London, Singapore, and New York, and we're bringing it to Sydney. Uh, and the idea is it's, it looks at the future of next-gen commerce, which basically means that the way that people have, have to do business has changed so much in even just the last sort of five or ten years because this sort of millennial, we, we even call it millennial mindset rather than just an age demographic. They want to be sort of marketed to, sold to in a very different way than generations before them. They look for things like brand authenticity, convenience, um, meaning, online shopping, personalized experiences, digital, um, all of that kind of stuff. When they're um, making a purchase, they're not necessarily brand loyal and you can't uh, advertise to them the way that 
traditionally you would have done in the past, whether through TV or radio or even with online ads. They're, they're digitally native and have sort of grown up with phones in their hands. And so they know how to ignore that kind of that kind of advertising. So it's how do you get their attention and keep their attention long enough to get them to sort of make a purchase, follow your brand, um, all that kind of stuff. So the event sort of looks at that and as well as, you know, how disruptive startups have come in and, and changed businesses like Airbnb and Uber. How does a big business like a hotel industry keep up when a really small sort of agile tech startup can come in and just totally change an industry? So it looks at all of that. So give us a bit of an overview perhaps of some of the topics or some of the speakers at the event. Um, so we've got some absolutely fantastic um, speakers and brands who are coming, both from really big sort of global industries, some of Australia's biggest companies, as well as some really cool, successful startups. Patrick Smith, who's the CEO of The Iconic, is speaking. Uh, John Elliott, Managing Director of Tom's Australia. Alexandra Sloan, who's head of marketing at Facebook, the country head of Airbnb, the head of marketing at Airbnb. All of those kinds of speakers are coming, and they're just going to be talking about industries like travel, fashion, beauty, food, beverage, innovation, and things like how millennials and the millennial mindset are shaping the future of all of those industries. Talking about sort of branding, marketing, digital data, all of that kind of stuff. Okay, Lauren. So tell us who should attend the event. Really, the event is kind of for for everyone, both big brands and startups. Anyone who sort of is looking to, you know, big businesses looking to potentially reinvent themselves or innovative startups who we can learn from or who want to form form new partnerships, Um, any kind of forward-thinking commercial leaders who sort of want to develop their businesses or uh, even solution providers. And and really, it's across pretty much every industry. So, you know, we're looking at people who are involved in digital, marketing, e-commerce, retail. It, It really is a large spread. Okay. And tell us, how should people go about booking their tickets? The best thing that you can do and to sort of find out more information is to go to the website, which is millennial20-20.com forward slash Sydney. You can find out more there and also just click the book tickets link, or you can email us at contact at millennial20-20.com. Fantastic. Well, look, I'm really excited about this event. I am going to be there. So if any of you guys that are listening right now can make it along, please make sure that you hit me up on Chantal at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. Let me know if you're coming along because I would love to meet up with you guys. And Lauren, I want to say thank you so much for bringing this fantastic event to Sydney. Uh, I know that uh, you mentioned it's not the only place in the world that the event is. So Guys, when you do jump on the website and if you're not around in Sydney for uh, the upcoming event, then make sure you check out all the other information that's on the website and the locations and dates for the other events around the world. So Lauren, thank you so much for coming along and joining us on the Fitness Business Podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me and uh, I hope to see you there. MyZone is a wearable technology platform that leverages personal goal setting, gamification, and social platforms to motivate your members. To find out more, go to myzone.org. Get ready for this week's bonus segment, your extra injection of information, education, and inspiration to strengthen your fitness business. Today, I'm speaking to Mark Miller, the Chief Operating Officer of Merit Clubs. Mark, welcome along to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, you have tribe team training in your clubs. So what made you decide to implement tribe? Uh, Well, about two years ago, I had taken it at one of the conferences and experienced it, and I just thought it was a fantastic workout. And then it kind of got me thinking that, you know, I I grew up in this um, industry as a trainer. So I came up the ranks and had always learned how to do one-on-one training, but never was really comfortable with the groups and all that. And I was never a Group X instructor. I tried to be, though. I tried to teach spinning classes, stuff like that, but I was horrible at it. And so I had these fears and misconceptions. And so when I took Tribe, I realized how easy it was. And it was a preset format that could actually enable a trainer to do that. So I started thinking about how... Maybe all of our trainers started thinking the same way I was or feeling the same way. So I went back, talked to my team, had two of them come out to Ursa the next year, experience it, talked to JP, and uh, we just thought it was a great solution for us. So since you initially implemented Tribe, how has it actually improved your business? Well, before having Tribe, we really struggled to get small group training off the ground and just could not at all. And I think it's now giving us an avenue that we actually have a small group training program. But more so, it's actually taught us how to 
organize it a little bit more and how to work within the different seasons and how to to keep the process growing. Whereas in the past, we kind of ran them as one-offs. You know, it was one small group training program, then another one, and where this one really taught us what true small group training program was, which is kind of a journey of time. So I think it's really helped us a lot. And have you been able to see a direct financial result of having Tribe in the club? Yeah, so um, in the two years since we started, like I said before, we, over nine clubs, we were doing small group training. If we did $10,000 a month, we were probably lucky. We now have Tribe in four clubs, and we're doing double, if not almost triple that, as an organization, and it's growing. And so we're finding that people are staying with it longer. And it's even helped us penetrate into uh, a greater percentage of our members being involved in something. So prior to that, we would get 7% of our members into personal training and always had a pretty good penetration there. But that was it. Now we have 7%, but we've got like another 3% of our members doing small group training. And we're even starting to see a crossover from our Group X program, which has always been strong because we've always penetrated 35% plus in that program. So what would you say to anyone that's considering introducing tribe team training? Well, the first thing I would tell them is stop thinking about it and just go do it. Because I think a lot of times we overanalyze and we start to look at it as a as a financial thing. And I can tell you that we looked at it differently. We looked at it as an investment and a way of taking care of our members and improving their lives. And when we started looking at it that way, it just took care of itself and the return on investment was less than a year. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today on the Fitness Business Podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Pre-core quick fire five. Speaking of Mark Miller, not only do we catch up to chat about tribe team training, he also happens to be our main guest in next week's show. As you'll hear, we did this interview at Club Industry on Facebook Live. So if you want to watch the pre-call Quick Fire 5 with Mark, just head over to the Fitness Business Podcast Facebook page and you can check it out. For now, here's the audio version of our chat. I'm joined this afternoon by Mark Miller, the Chief Operating Officer of Merit Athletic Clubs. Mark, welcome along. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> really excited to have you here. So you are presenting on Thursday and Friday. Yep. Tell us a little bit about the topics you're presenting on. Uh, so I'm doing one on marketing, which is kind of a new thing for me because I've never really done that aspect of it. But we've been doing heavily marketing with our clubs and all that. I've got a you know, pretty good handle on our marketing director. has taught me a lot, so she's done a great job in helping me along the way. Yeah. And uh, the second one is actually on what you can learn outside the industry, which is really something that I've become passionate about over the last two years, um, and doing things different, not competing with everyone else, but really trying to learn and do things that nobody else has done. So I'm pretty excited. I'm really excited to hear more about that. And we're going to be diving a little bit into that topic in our interview today, but you guys are not going to hear it for a little while yet because the main interview <laughs> comes out later on. So stay um, tuned. Stay it's tuned. Coming. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so for today, we're just going to do our pre core quick five five. Okay. And let's start off with the question, why do you do what you do? Oh, uh, it's a great question. So I've been doing this for God, over 25 years now. And I think it all started when I actually got injured. Um, playing sports and all that, and I was going through rehabilitation, and I wanted to learn how to help other people. And I just got bitten by the bug when you could make a difference in someone's life, and I started to realize that I wasn't really working. You know, it was like having fun, and so every day I wake up, and I'm excited about what I do. That's great. That's a great reason. And what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Uh, you know, I think the best piece of advice that I ever got from anybody was to be true to yourself, and if you do the right thing, Everything else takes care of itself. And that's really kind of what our company is built on. Uh, and our owner was always big about that. So I think I learned a lot. And what's one personal habit that helps you become better at what you do? Oh, early to rise, get my coffee, read, just relax and, you know, let the stress of the day kind of go out early so that I don't even have it with me. So it's a bit of a morning ritual. Yeah, yeah. every day. Yeah. Every day. I got to have that coffee too, you know. I, I know. I know exactly what you mean. Sometimes um, three or four cups. So. Don't worry, I'm on to about four for today. So That's great. I appreciate that. And what's one book, blog, or podcast that you'd recommend and why? Oh, God, there's so many. You know, actually, I get this question a lot from my leaders and all that. And uh, I actually put together a book summary and a resource list. There's so many of them. But the one I've been giving away lately so much is called The One Thing by Gary Keller. It really talks about how you... Um, organize and focus your day and really take care of it, which I'm learning a lot of people 
can't seem to do it. Like they're juggling all these elephants mm -hmm. and uh, they just can't do it. So this book's really helped a lot. Excellent. Thank you for that recommendation. And we touched on it earlier, but what are we going to talk about during the main interview? Well, hopefully I'll be able to shed some light on different things, but I'd love to be able to talk about what you can learn outside the industry and how, if we start doing things differently, we could really probably change this industry. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Mark. So Exciting. thank you so much for joining pleasure. us. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining me for another Podtober show. Before we finish off today, a quick reminder that all of the resources, links, and transcripts for today's show can be found at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. Thank you to all of our partners for their support, and thank you to our foundation partner, Active Management. You can go to www.fitnessbusinesspodcast.com forward slash active for a free business development ebook. That's everything for this week. I will see you next week. And remember, what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others.